Hello and welcome to the ASEAN Pacific episodes. Today we are together again uh, with a special guest and different subject. Our live streams about the ASEAN Pacific region continue twice a week. Don't forget to uh, subscribe to my channel uh, so you don't miss our upcoming surprise, uh, surprise uh, live stream with surprise guests. In this uh, episode special, we are going to discuss Taiwan and Southeast Asian relation. Uh, my special guest today is Rati Kabinawa. Rati is a doctoral student in the Department of Political Science and International Relation and ASEAN Studies in School of Social Sciences at the University of Western Australia. Rati is doctoral research project uh, investigates the engagement and the in interaction between transnational actors and the state in Taiwan's Southeast Asia foreign policy. It addresses two main questions of why and how has the Taiwanese government incorporated transnational actor in foreign policy. This project also examines uh, the cross-border politics of Southeast Asian students, uh, alumni, and the migrant workers in Taiwan, Taiwanese uh, business people in Southeast Asia, and epistemic communities between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. Uh, welcome, Rati. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Lokman, for inviting me here to your um, broadcast um, uh, event on Taiwan Southeast Asia relations. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, my question. Uh, Rati, uh, sure. can you please explain the historical context of uh, relationship between the Taiwan and Southeast Asia countries, particularly after the uh, rose a settlement in Taiwan in 1949. Okay, um, I will first begin with the um, civil war context between uh, between the uh, between the nationalist and the communist uh, parties in uh, mainland China. At the end of the civil war between the ruling nationalists and the communists in 1949, Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the Chinese Nationalist Party or the Kuomintang or KMT, had to retreat to the island of Taiwan. The Communist Party then established the People's Republic of China in the mainland, while the nationalist regime continued to, co to call itself the Republic of China uh, in Taiwan. During the, the Chiang, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and Chiang ching kuo era, uh, Taiwan's foreign policy was mainly focused on striving for the maintenance of international recognition of their regime as the sole legitimate ruler of the entire nation of China. So to pursue, to pursue this goal, the ROC government utilized overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia to promote Chinese nationalism abroad and project the image of ROC as free China and the guardian of traditional Chinese cultures. As we know as well, Southeast Asia hosted largest number of overseas Chinese um, in the region, uh, outside, of, outside of Hong Kong and Macau. The importance of overseas Chinese in Taipei's foreign policy can be traced back to historical narratives, especially uh, with the Sun Yat-sen, the father of the Republic uh, Khan Revolution of 1911, claim that the overseas Chinese, particularly in the ASEAN region, uh, were always, uh, Sun Yat-sen always referred them as the mother of the revolution. Okay, and considering their contribution in terms of human and financial resources during the revolution. And then the, 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 the policy continued, the policy or the mobilization policy towards the overseas Chinese continues. They re, uh, the ROC government uh, under the Chiang Kai-shek um, regime recruited some of the overseas Chinese as Kuomintang loyalists who also serve as Taipei's political agents in the region, in Southeast Asia. Some of these loyalists attended the annual celebration of Double Ten, like the 10th of October or National Day Ceremony in Taipei at the invitation of the ROC government. In addition to recruiting political, political agents, the ROC government also provided scholarship 
for overseas Chinese students in Southeast Asia to come and study in Taiwan. So this is actually the um, the foundation or the background of uh, later on why Taiwan recruited many students from Southeast Asia even until today. It was actually recruited from the uh, from the tradition of cultivating uh, interest from the overseas Chinese student. Okay, supporting the education of overseas Chinese students became a central tool for the ROC to raise nationalist support and gain legitimation among overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia. Okay, and um, this overseas Chinese politic was the main feature of the relationship between Taiwan and Southeast Asia in their early relationship. And we cannot also forget the factor of the Cold War itself. Okay, during the Cold War, um, the U.S. Uh, saw the ROC as a buffer zone to contain the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. And one of the tools to actually um, uh, contain the spread of communism was actually through the overseas Chinese, because they were all they were divided between pro Taipei, uh, pro Taipei, and pro Beijing. Um, pro Taipei in China, pro, pro Chinese type, pro Taipei or pro Beijing. Okay, that's for the uh, historical context of the relationship between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. Lokman, I think you are muted. Oh, sorry. Can you, can you explain the one China policy and uh, Southeast Asian uh, country standpoint regarding the China and one China policy? Okay, it is actually interesting regarding the one China policy in the region uh, because uh, not all Southeast Asian countries uh, shared a similar standpoint regarding one China policy. Before Beijing successfully took over the United Nations China seat from the ROC in 1971, Taipei maintained diplomatic relations with Thailand, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Indonesia suspended its diplomatic relations with the PRC in 1967 due to China's alleged support for the 1965 communist coup in Indonesia. However, Jakarta never ever switched its diplomatic recognition to Taiwan. Um, the situation was changing after 1970s. Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines switched their diplomatic relations from ROC to the PRC in 1975. Indonesia, meanwhile, resumed its diplomatic relation with Beijing in 1990s and then followed by Singapore. Okay, and when, when this country established diplomatic um, relations or switch from diplomatic relation from ROC to the PRC, then they, they kind of sort of um, having a kind of mutual agreement with the PRC government to adopt the one China principle. They are one China principle. And um, um, this one China principle is actually uh, while maintaining diplomatic relation as a part of maintaining diplomatic relation with Beijing, these uh, Southeast Asian countries, on the other hand, also develop cordial relationship with Taiwan in the area of economic, trade, investment, education, tourism, and migrant workers. Taiwan could also maintain its starlight military project with the Singaporean government. Okay, each of Southeast Asian countries also set up Taipei representative or trade and economic and cultural office in their respective countries. Indonesia, for example, hosted two Taipei's economic and trade office, one in Jakarta in the capital city and one in Surabaya, Indonesia's second largest city. So Beijing's one China policy does exist in Southeast Asia. But countries in Southeast Asia are also keen to maintain warm and friendly relations with Taiwan. Countries in the region are also welcome to any efforts in preserving peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. So each of Southeast Asian countries, they have their own one China principle. Um, but, uh, but most of them, 
like these five countries, most of them also maintain a cordial relationship with Taiwan. So it become quite challenging while they don't um, formally diplo uh, establish diplomatic relations with Taiwan due to their uh, uh, one China principle. Uh, but then they maintain a so-called people-to-people connection, economic and trade, business and investment relationship with Taiwan. In 1994, uh, Taiwan launched uh, its first iteration of the Go South policy. Uh, can you, Rati, can you elaborate on this policy and how this policy improved Taiwan's relation with uh, Southeast Asian countries? Okay, the Go South policy itself was launched by former President Li Tonghui, aimed at di diversifying Taiwan's economic and trade from China to Southeast Asia. The policy was actually part of President Li Tonghui pragmatic diplomacy in the region. By, by being pragmatic mean that Taipei sought for international recognition of the ROC as political entity separate from the mainland, from, from the mainland China. The main element of the Go South policy was investment led by the Taiwanese business people. Taiwanese investment under the Go South policy program bore promising results for Taipei's foreign policy. The most remarkable achievement was the expansion and enhancement of Taiwan's de facto representative offices in Southeast Asia. For example, uh, the name of this office change, changed from being obscure to be more widely recognized. For example, the office in Indonesia changed its name from the Chinese Chamber of Commerce into the Taipei Economic and Trade Office in Jakarta. The use of Taipei instead of Chinese gave a higher profile and significant visibility to Taiwan because the, the, the goal of the pragmatic diplomacy at that time was to uh, seeking uh, international recognition as the as the uh, of the ROC as political entity separate from the mainland. So no longer using Chinese, but rather to use Taipei to improve Taiwan's visibility in the region. Uh, President Lee was also able to make several visits. We can consider it as an official visit as a, as a Taiwan's president to Southeast, to Southeast Asian countries to promote Taiwan's international recognition, to promote Taiwan's business and investment. Taiwan also signed an, a number of bilateral investment agreement with countries with, with with countries in Southeast Asia, so there are actually, there were actually quite a lot of improvement uh, following the promotion of the Go South policy and under under the flagship of pragmatic diplomacy, uh, Taiwan's pragmatic diplomacy in the region led by the President Li Tonghui. Taiwan. Uh... Taiwan and Southeast uh, Asia maintain robust people-to-people uh, -people relation. Uh, can you elaborate uh, on this relationship? What kind of relation between the Taiwan and Southeast Asia? As I mentioned previously, um, Lokman, people-to-people uh, -people relations are the key to Taiwan's and Southeast Asia relations. Um, Taiwan and Southeast Asia have maintained maintain a robust people-to-people -people relationship since the promotion of Go South policy in 1994 by promoting the Taiwanese business people to invest in Southeast Asia, to diversify their investment from China to Southeast Asia. And then over the next decade, Taiwan regularly receive students, workers, spouses from Southeast Asia. ASEAN member countries, meanwhile, hosted Taiwanese business people and their investment, sustaining political economic linkages between the two sides. Currently, there are more than uh, 30,000 uh, Southeast Asian students in Taiwan. They uh, constitute the second largest, I think now the first largest of international students in Taiwan is actually coming from Southeast Asia. And there are seven, uh, 700,000 Southeast Asian migrant workers uh, residing in Taiwan. Uh, they are mainly come from Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, and Thailand. 
Southeast Asian spouses and their children in Taiwan constitute around 2% of Taiwan's total population. And they are now under the new southbound policy, these uh, spouses and their children called as a new immigrants in Taiwan. Um, on the other hand, there are around 10,000 of Taiwanese business people res residing in Southeast Asia. So from the, from the number itself, you can tell that Taiwan actually maintain a closed or and robust people-to-people -people relationship with Southeast Asia. And they channels uh, Taipei into the region amidst the international isolation of the Taiwan itself. Taiwan, uh, right, Taiwan receives a large number of students from Southeast Asia, as you say. Can you uh, tell us on the importance of these uh, students for Taiwan Southeast Asia? relation okay as i also mentioned that taipei has been utilized students from southeast asia to promote its foreign policy goals since the roc settlement in taiwan in 1949 but, but however uh, during that time uh, taiwan only recruited the overseas chinese students or the ethnic chinese southeast asian ethnic chinese students to to, to study in, tai in Taiwan's university. This relationship has evolved, particularly after the promotion of democracy and national identity in Taiwan in the 1990s. During the authoritarian regime, Taiwan mainly recruited overseas Chinese students. In the post-authoritarian era, there was, a, there, there was an increase of non-ethnic Chinese students from Southeast Asia studying in Taiwan. Okay, so, um, Southeast Asian students go to Taiwan and then they can have uh, or they can choose between two status as an international student or as an ethnic Chinese student or overseas Chinese student. And these graduates, um, once they graduated, uh, graduating from uh, Taiwan's university, they established Taiwan's Alumni Association and in their home countries. Like, for example, I can, I think there are now more than 54 Taiwan's alumni association established in Southeast Asia region. And the, this Taiwan, uh, this association serve as transmission channels between Taiwan and Southeast Asian countries. The alumni association also involved in recruiting new students who are keen to continue their higher degree education in Taiwan, bringing more people to come to Taiwan and maintaining or sustaining the people-to-people -people connection. So this is actually quite um, unique. So once the student graduated, they will join the alumni association. And this alumni association helped the Taiwanese government to recruit new students to come to Taiwan to study in Taiwan. Okay, and and, and it, it actually bringing more people to come to Taiwan and maintaining the people-to-people -people connection. The cross-border activities of these Southeast Asian students also help to improve Taiwan's visibility in the region and promote solidarity from the experience and value that these students accrue while living and studying in Taiwan. So they are actually play, playing a, a quite important role in promoting Taiwan and Southeast Asia relations. In, in addition to the students, Taiwan also hosts migrant workers from Southeast Asian countries. So how do you think these workers might play a role in the relationship between Taiwan and Southeast Asian countries? Okay, um, regarding migrant workers, my arguments will be quite similar to the importance of Southeast Asian students in Taiwan. These workers serve as a backbone for Taiwan's economy. They work in Taiwan's vital industry and manufacture and also support Taiwanese families by providing domestic assistances in taking care of the elderly. Um, they also contributed to the realization of multiculturalism in Taiwan. And Taipei utilized them actually to promote its democracy and robust civil society images. 
um, these workers may also influence the cordiality of relationship between Taiwan and Southeast Asia via image building. So the quality of treatments given to these workers by the Taiwanese government will influence the quality of relationship between Taiwan and Southeast Asia country. So anything particularly related to the migrant workers, it will actually influence the relationship between Taiwan's government and the Southeast Asian government. This, the, like for example, Indonesia and Taiwan signed um, a number of um, agreement to recruit migrant workers from Indonesia to coming to Taiwan. So whatever treatment given to these workers will actually eventually influence the relationship, the warm and friendly relationship between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. So in some, I would say that workers and students from Southeast Asia also help to reduce Taiwan's dependence on China because too many workers, students or business people from China present a threat, national security threat to Taiwan uh, because it might help Beijing impose its unification policy towards Taiwan. So actually, uh, beyond economic, beyond socio-cultural uh, background, this people-to-people -people connection help Taipei to secure its national security interests by not uh, by actually against uh, um, against Beijing's policy of imposing the unification process. In uh, in 2016, the Taiwanese government launched the new South Point policy. Can you compare it and uh, contrast for us the Go South policy and the new South Point policy? What is the differences and between these two policies? Um, okay, um, the new South Bond policy is actually a continuation from the previous Go South policy. And it that was introduced in 1994, as I said, as I mentioned before, by the late President Li Denghui. And then it has, a, it has a similar dimension of maintaining economic and trade relations, maintaining the investment, maintaining the people-to-people -people exchanges between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. However, the new Southbound policy also shared different characteristics from the Go South policy mainly on the area of cooperation and the targeted countries. First, the Go South policy was mainly focused on economic and trade exchanges, while the NSP expand the cooperation to include people to people. So actually the Go South policy was solely promoted economic and trade exchange, this um, investment business, but now um, Taiwan officially recognized the importance of people to people and they include this element of people to people into the new South Bond policy. So the new staff Bond policy has four framework of cooperation and one of the framework is actually um, focused or uh, on promoting the people to people relations in terms of education, in terms of uh, new immigrants, in terms of um, uh, promoting workers, uh, migrant workers policy and stuff like that. So it's officially um, admitted the the importance of people to people. And the second, the second um, uh, different characteristic was the go south policy was a single direction. At that time, mostly was a policy from Taiwan to Southeast Asia. So Taiwan investment, Taiwan improving trade relation with Southeast Asia. However, the new southbound policy aims toward mutual exchanges between the two sides. So not only Taiwan invests in Southeast Asia, but Taiwan also receives Southeast Asian investment in Taiwan. So it aims to mutual exchanges, two-way exchanges between the two sides. Um, the, third, uh, the third, the new southbound policy involves public and private sectors participation. Um, unlike the Go South policy, who was actually led mainly by the state-owned enterprises for the business people, for example, or for the investment, the new South Bond policy encouraged both public and private sectors in Taiwan to participate 
in their engagement in Southeast Asia. Okay, and the last one, of course, the MSP expands its target countries to include Australia, New Zealand, and South Asia. Um, as we can see now, Taiwan improved its relation with India, for example, with the Australia and the New Zealand. So the Go South policy was mainly focused on Southeast Asia, but now they expand its policy. The new Southbound policy include not only Southeast Asia, but also New Zealand, Australia, and South Asia. That's actually the main um, differences, if I should compare between the compare and contrast between the Go South and the New South Bond policy. Uh, Rati, can you briefly analyze how the New South Bond policy uh, helps Taiwan to diversify its market from China uh, to Southeast Asian countries? Okay, um, actually, as I said, the new South Bond policy has four, um, uh, four main areas of cooperation. Um, for uh, the first one is the talent, talent exchange to, imp uh, to recruit um, uh, people to people or students from Southeast Asia. And then uh, fourth regional links, um, uh, improving the economic cooperation and um the last one i forgot but it's actually uh, related to the uh there are four four main areas of cooperation and and with the new South bond policy taiwan has designed various new policy programs to increase the number of southeast asian living working and studying in taiwan for example for in the tourism sector the easing of visa recruitments under the new South bond policy has brought large numbers of tourists from Southeast Asia to Taiwan. It is a, like um, um, Taiwan, uh, uh, Taiwanese tourists vis visited Southeast Asia and now they also have a large number of Southeast Asian tourists visiting Taiwan. And the volume of tourists from ASEAN increased up to 56% from 2016 between 2016 and 2018. On the higher education from, front, the Taiwanese government offered various scholarship programs to bring more students from Southeast Asia to Taiwan. The new Southbound policy, for example, doubled Indonesian students' enrollment uh, from 4,000 uh, 4, students in 2017 to more than 8,000 uh, 8, students in 2019. And other countries such as Vietnam and the Philippines also experienced similar trends. They double the number of uh, uh, they, they double the number of their students studying in Southeast Asia. Why? Because of a lot of incentives, a lot of scholarship, a lot, a lot of fundings um, given to these students to come and to study in Taiwan. And over the past decade, as we know, 40% of Taiwan's total trade volume has relied on China. However, after the promotion of the new southbound policy, the figure is now, is now down to 38%. Well, it's still quite high, but actually Taiwan could lower down its, its, its um, trade, uh, trade volume with China and the government intends to get it lower again. So, uh, so um, it helps actually in, in some that the new South Bond policy helps Taiwan to diversify its market from China to Southeast Asia. As a Taiwanese uh, studies student, what areas of cooperation that Taiwan needs to improve with Southeast Asian countries? Well, actually, there are a lot of areas that Taiwan could explore uh, with the Southeast Asian countries. Um, I would say, um, first and foremost, improving the protection of migrant workers by negotiating direct herring and abolishing private channels. As we know that Southeast Asian migrant workers are vulnerable to human trafficking and forced labor. 
and for example as well the current COVID-19 outbreak in Taiwanese factories also challenge Taiwan's image of human rights. So as a, as a beacon of democracy who are actually actively promoting human rights, Taiwan might actually also try to improve the protection towards migrant workers. As I mentioned before, any treatments given to these workers will influence the cordiality of relationship between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. So if Taiwan could improve the protection of these migrant workers, then it will eventually help Taiwan to also improve its image, its soft power image as a human rights protection, protector, as a promoter of democracy and stuff like that. Because these workers are, um, are really important for the Taiwanese society. Okay, they help the Taiwanese economy to develop, to grow the Taiwanese economy, but they also, but however, at the same time, they also experience sort of discrimination within the society itself. Okay, and, and, and with the absence of diplomatic relations between Taiwan and Southeast Asia, it might actually hamper the relationship or the treatment given to this Southeast Asian workers, especially towards their protection and human, um, uh, uh, toward the protection of these workers. So I would say first and foremost, improve the protection and the living condition of migrant workers from Southeast Asia. Um, the, second, uh, the second area that Taiwan could actually explore is actually in the area of promoting democracy in the region. Uh, Taiwan is always labeled as beacon of democracy in Asia. Uh, I'm sure you might have heard about this uh, term before, that Taiwan is a beacon of democracy in Asia. And Taipei could actually play an active role in supporting democratization in the region that has been considered declining as you can see in Southeast Asia, for example, the recent uh, coup in Myanmar, the recent political protests or uh, in Thailand as well, it was actually the, the, the main idea and, and it was actually another, another search of opportunity for Taiwan who, who could actually help democratization in the region. It might be difficult, but it might be difficult if Taiwan play in the government to government, but as what as the new southbound policy encourage um, the the participation of civil or or private uh, uh, private society or private sectors, then Taiwan could actually develop uh, uh, or promote democratization in the region via the think tanks cooperation, youth exchanges on how to promote the, uh, the promote democracy among youth between Taiwan and Southeast Asia, media and journalism on how to countering this information between Taiwan's media and the Southeast Asian media, and also uh, cooperation between civil society organization. I know that Taiwan uh, receive uh, foreign NGOs, allows foreign, foreign NGOs uh, uh, who has um, democracy and human rights basis to establish an office in Taiwan. And Taiwan could actually utilize these foreign NGOs to promote Taiwan democratic image in Southeast Asian countries. So, you, uh, so this foreign NGO could be a um, channel for Taiwan to involve in the democratic promotion in the region via civil society organization or exchanges. So while it is, it might be difficult to reach, uh, to reach into the governmental relations, why not of using the civil society organization by, by, uh, by support from the foreign NGOs, like the, for example, the US, the US or uh, the US-based NGO in Taiwan that promote democracy, helping Taiwan to promote democratization in the region. And Taiwan also has uh, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. 
and I know that Taiwan's Foundation for Democracy um, has been um, quite active in giving or in uh, re uh, giving a, uh, an award like Human Rights Promotion Awards to some of the Southeast Asian leaders. I think uh, there were like uh, leaders from Indonesia and Malaysia who received the Human Rights Awards from the Taiwan's Foundation for Democracy. That was actually a good sign. And then Taiwan could actually uh, play a more active role in promoting this democratization in the region. Um, the last uh, um, area of cooperation that I would like to highlight is the uh, equal relationship in education sector. Um, as we know that the number of the Southeast Asian students studying in Taiwan always increase every year. Okay, as I mentioned before, Indonesian students uh, enrollment doubled, uh, doubled the, uh, the, the NSP doubled the enrollment of Indonesian students in Taiwan. However, if we compare with the Taiwanese student pursuing a university degree in Southeast Asia, the number was far lower than the enrollment of Southeast Asian students in Taiwan's university. Like the uh, uh, statistic, from the Taiwan's Ministry, Ministry of Education recorded that less than 1,000 Taiwanese students departing for Southeast Asia to study in 2020. But the number of the Southeast Asian students studying in Taiwan was more than 30,000 students compared to only 1,000 students, Taiwanese students in Southeast Asia. So there is an unequal exchanges between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. And because new, the new southbound policy was actually aimed to improve mutual exchanges, now it is the time for the Taiwanese government, uh, uh, for the Taiwanese government to improve, to encourage more Taiwanese students to study in Southeast Asian countries. So there would be a balanced relationship between the two countries or the two sides. I think that's true. Uh, that 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 that's are the three um, area of cooperation that Taiwan and Southeast Asia could improve in the uh, improving the promotion or the protection of migrant workers, promoting democratization in the region, and the last improving and improving equal exchanges on students cooperation between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. Uh, when we come to again to South Bund policy, uh, how do you assess the first uh, five, five years of the Taiwan's new South Bund policy with uh, Southeast Asian countries? Okay, um, as I have mentioned previously, the, the new South Bund policy has helped Taiwan to improve the number of exchanges with Southeast Asia in the area of education, tourism, workers, investment, trade, and economy. However, the pandemic COVID-19 hampered the continuation of these exchanges as Taiwan and Southeast Asian countries are still struggling to cope with the development of its virus, of the virus. The closing of border between the two sides influenced the flow of migration that has become the core pillar of the new southbound policy. So moving forward, Taiwan and Southeast Asian country might want to explore further cooperation to overcome the problems coming from the pandemic. So at the moment, um, uh, Taiwan suspended the, uh, Taiwan closed its border uh, for migrant workers from Indonesia. Yeah, I think it, uh, it was, uh, the, uh, I think it, it's already um, quite a few months. I think uh, the last time they closed the border was in um, December last year, until now. They still closed the border for the Indonesian workers. And now Taiwan's experienced a COVID-19 outbreak for about uh, two months already. And, and as well, the, the sending of the students also um, were um, um, uh, reduced. By, by by the COVID-19 issue. So moving forward on how these two sides could actually cooperate in promoting the, uh, in, in promoting more um, exchanges amidst the pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, 
thank you, Rati. There was a comment and um, there is also a question. Mm -hmm. This is for you, I think, the question. How can we reconcile? I think, okay, how how can we reconcile the need to promote democracy in the region and similar to have a suffering lives with the few remaining allies? As I said before, if we, um, if Taiwan wants to promote democracy, it shouldn't be a uh, truth be um, the governmental level because it, it might be, a, uh, it might consider as a, intervening the uh, domestic affairs of, of the countries of Southeast Asia, because as we know that um, the non-interference principle in Southeast Asia, in Asian countries, was is quite strong. However, um, Taiwan might go into the people-to-people -people connection. As I said, student exchange, youth program in, in, in promote, on promoting democracy, that's the first time, the first thing, I, because I think, because I know that youth politics, uh, Taiwan, Taiwan's youth are very, um, how to say it, are very engaging with democracy. They are very active. Um, I can see it from the last election in 2020. Youth, uh, the youth in uh, Taiwanese youth is actually uh, leading the democratic promotion of the of the country itself. So this is something that Taiwan could actually explore and promoting democracy via youth exchanges between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. And I know there are some transnational um, solidarity movement organized by Thailand, politi uh, Thailand students, uh, Thai students who study in Taiwan and they promoted transnational activism, promoted solidarity uh, to promote democracy during the political protest in Thailand. So that, that is actually one good example. And how Taiwan could actually, the Taiwanese government could actually sustain this kind of youth training and youth exchanges on democracy. That's the first, the first line of cooperation. The second line of the cooperation could go into the media and journalism. Okay, I'm currently actually doing a research on on the representation of Taiwan in Indonesian media, because I'm coming from Indonesia and then I read the Indonesian uh, new, national newspaper. And I'm actually looking at the pattern of the Taiwan's democratic representation in Indonesian newspaper. So I can I can say that now the, 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 the promotion of Taiwan as a democracy has, um, uh, the idea of Taiwan as a democracy has been promoted widely. In, in the Indonesian news media, uh, mostly the na national news media, and and how this uh, promotion of, of Taiwan's democracy in Indonesian news media could actually sustain or could actually develop um, into a into a journalism and media cooperation between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. As far as I know, Beijing invited several. A number of journalism from Southeast Asia or particularly from Indonesia to visit Uyghur and Xinjiang. Okay, in order to witness, in order to give access to these journalists to witness what is exactly happened in Uyghur and Xinjiang. And it is, it is part of the uh, Beijing's public diplomacy to promote, uh, uh, to, to actually cover what is actually happening in Xinjiang and Uyghur. And, and Taiwan could actually adopt a similar way to promote its democracy. I know Taiwan has several museums of democracy, several exhibition and museum of democracy. Why not uh, inviting journalism, journalists from Southeast Asia to see, to witness the democratic uh, development in Taiwan the, demo, the historical context on how Taiwan moved into democracy, what Taiwan has been achieved. Invite those journalists come to Taiwan to witness the process of democratization. And once these journalists return back to their home country, they will report on democratization of Taiwan. 
that's the, the that's the second the, sec, the second way of promoting democracy via the private sectors the third line would be on civil society organization as i said before taiwan allows the establishment of foreign ngos mostly coming from the european country and the us and they are all promoting democracy and human rights in taiwan so how to use these foreign ngos to help taiwan promote its image as democracy and also to promote democratization in the region via the relationship or cooperation with the third sector or the private sector of or the ngo itself i believe from those three um, areas of cooperation in promoting democracy taiwan could actually help democratization in the region okay so and then and and, and because taiwan has been quite familiar on how how improving people to people relation on how or, or maintaining people to people relation i think it should actually use people to people connection again as well to promote democratization in the region and it shouldn't be any any uh, and it will actually reduce the uh, uh, the suspicion that taiwan wanted to interfere the uh, dom uh, the, 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 the domestic affairs of these Southeast Asian countries. Thank you very much, Rati. Uh, really, you give uh, a broad explanation as an answer. Thank you for joining me today and uh, provide us a great knowledge about Southeast Asian countries and Taiwan relation. Sure. Uh, <laughs> thank you for, uh, for my audiences to, today who they watching us. Please uh, don't forget uh, to subscribe to my channel uh, for next programs. And thank you very much, Rati, again for okay, joining. Thank me. you. Thank you very much, Lokman, for inviting me. And it's such a great honor to be uh, here as a guest in your program. And I hope that um, this program will continue to invite more scholars um, so we can actually learn from a broader perspective regarding what is happening in the region from the Southeast Asian perspective or China's perspective or Taiwan's perspective. It's a great program, actually. I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you yeah. very much. Again. Bye. Okay, see you on next programs.